from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And I'm really excited to join this day of invigorating discussions about our digital collections as data. And I'll be speaking, um, as Kate indicated, about a new initiative we've launched to, uh, to train librarians and methods for digital scholar research. So I'll first give, uh, briefly give context around the issues that motivated our projects and some of the landscape, and then talk about our project itself. Um, so as we've seen and heard from presenters earlier today, accessible digitized content and data is increasing rapidly, and the roles of libraries are changing accordingly as more researchers and teachers uh, and integrate data into their work in scholarship. As the Association for Research Libraries Strategic Thinking and Design Initiative Report declares in its vision of the future, in 2033, the research library will have shifted from its role as a knowledge service provider within the university to become a collaborative partner within a rich and diverse learning and research ecosystem, end quote. This future de de declaration frames how librarians are and will encounter new needs and types of research queries that challenge our skill sets, knowledge, and scope of library services. And it's been made evident today, the data deluged is eminent for the humanities and social sciences as much as the sciences. So in light of all this data that we have in the humanities and social sciences, how can libraries prepare for emer supporting emergent data-driven research? So I won't uh, repeat the points made by previous presenters about data, but I wanted to highlight this characterization uh, of data from the Our Cultural Commonwealth Report, published about 10 years ago from the American Council of Learned Societies, because it's in the context of building cyber infrastructure for the humanities and social sciences. And it de defines uh, concisely but thoroughly that richly diverse types of data that rich research needs. And the report goes on to say that cyber infrastructure isn't just the hardware and the software, but it's the people. And to quote, a cyber infrastructure for humanities and social sciences must encourage interactions between the expert and the amateur, the creative artist and the scholar, the teacher and the student. It's not just the collection of data, digital or otherwise, that matters, at least as important as the activity that goes around it, contributes to it, and eventually integrates with it." End quote. So of equal importance in, to the data is the researcher, teacher, and librarian slash research expert who explore, expand, and curate the data. Thus, we're prompted to examine what libraries are and should be doing to engage in digital scholarship. So there have been a number of studies in recent years that have looked at how libraries are accommodating their spaces, services, and personnel to serve in digital scholarship needs. And among others, the um, newly released ARL Spec Kit 350 by Rick Mulligan on digital scholarship centers and libraries that um, found that support is relatively new. Um, so that of the responding libraries, 67% of the digital scholarship library personnel had joined within the last five years, and 74% have been doing this digital scholarship work only in, for the less than five years. And digital scholarship support is frequently distributed across the libraries from liber librarians and archivists to professional support staff and student assistants. Support for digital scholarship in libraries is growing rapidly, but is still nascent. And then on the individual level, uh, other studies have examined what librarians are doing in digital scholarship um, now and what is needed. So there have been two recent volumes from ACRL and Purdue that present a variety of use cases of digital humanities programs and projects, and groups such as ACRL's Digital Humanities Interest Group and the New Library Special Interest Group and the Association for Digital Humanities Organizations are spaces where library and communities involved in DH are growing. And then several libraries have also begun to launch pro programs to train their librarians in digital scholarship skills, such as University of Maryland's DH Incubator, which Trevor will talk about in a few minutes, the Columbia Libraries Developing Librarian, and Harvard Library Lab, among many other, several others. But despite these initial advances, there's still a ways to go. And how can we empower all academic librarians to engage with digital scholarship and new forms of research? So this is where our project intends to step in. Uh, we proposed a project to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which they uh, kindly funded, that's called Digging Deeper, Reaching Further, Libraries Empowering Users to Mine Hottie Trust Digital Library Resources. So for the next few minutes, I'll talk about how our project seeks to build librarians' capacities and skills in digital scholarship methods, specifically by connecting librarians to collections, digital collections, via skill building and research methods for tech mining. So to first talk about our motivations and philosophies for the project. 
um, to set the context, um, our work is based in the Hathi Trust Research Center, which is the research arm of the Hathi Trust Digital Library. Many of you may be familiar with the Hathi Trust Digital Library as a digital library of over 14 million digitized texts and materials, or over 5 billion pages at last count. In the Hathi Trust ecosystem, the digital library collects digital content, provides public access, and preserves the digital content. While at the Research Center, we enable researchers to gather content from the digital library into curated data sets, or what we call work sets, and then analyze and produce new scholarly findings. Uh, the Hathi Trust Research Center is jointly led by the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Indiana University Bloomington, and we collaborate on research development of HTRC services and researcher support and we most prominently facilitate researcher access to textual data. So at the moment, you can obtain uh, access to the public domain corpus as full text and in other more granular formats, but our ultimate goal is to provide access to both out of copyright and in copyright text via tools that facilitate non-consumptive research. Um, and my HTRC colleagues are working um, on these new developments very soon, and that's a, a more details can be um, found on our website for that. But as we develop tools and research resources in the HTRC, we increasingly realize that in order to develop effective services for users, we need to know how they go about their work and learn firsthand from them what they need to do or, and or support large-scale text analysis research. So uh, in the last year, we conducted a user assessment study for the HTRC consisting of about 15 to 16 interviews thus far with scholars from a variety of disciplines, technologists, and librarians. Um, and HTRC team members Alex Kinnaman, Eleanor Dixon, and Peter Organisiak did some initial analysis of the interview data that we've coded to develop preliminary user personas, uh, the digital project librarian, the faculty member, and the graduate student. And so we're finalizing our analysis and these personas are not concrete by any means, but they begin to characterize the different levels of users that engage with our data. You have the faculty team member researcher with advanced tools or advanced needs, the newer graduate student researcher who's still exploring methods and tools, and then there is the research support personnel characterized here as the digital project librarian. And this user persona of the digital project librarian particularly caught our eye and affirmed something that we had been considering. As we seek to engage researchers in using the collections of the Hathi Trust Digital Library in their scholarship, we realized that librarians are a critical linchpin in connecting researchers to the data and tools as they strive to provide access to data and match tools to the researchers. Oh, and there's the circle. And so in 2015, we were awarded a three-year Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program Grant from the Institute of Museum Library Services to develop a digital scholarship training program from academic librarians, um, as titled there. Um, and I want to highlight the word empowerment in our, our title because empowerment is key to our program. We seek to teach librarians about the fundamental approaches to text mining, how to work with textual data, and then, as I'll explain in a minute, enable them to teach others. And then given that the HTRC is the anchor for our training and the textual data is uh, core to the HTRC, uh, the focus of curriculum is on text mining. But our goals are preparing librarians in ways that enable them to support digital scholarship more broadly. So here are our formal goals, as listed up here, um, arming librarians with new content for instructional services that address the curricular and research needs of students and faculty pursuing digital scholarship, empower librarians to become active research partners on digital projects at their institutions, and provide foundational uh, knowledge to transform academic library scholarly commons and DH centers into more data-intensive collaborative learning spaces through the use of this curriculum and the knowledge that enables them to participate in scholarly dialogues. So our project team um, is listed here. It's led by me, and then the co-PIs include my Illinois colleagues Beth Namachavaya and Stephen Downey, and we have four partner institutions who span different sizes and types of higher education institutions. So Indiana University Bloomington, which again is our HTRC partner as well, and is led by co-PI Angela Courtney, uh, Lafayette College, uh, Liberal Arts College, uh, Dean Neil McElroy and Therese Heidenwolf, Northwestern University with co-PI Jeff Morris, and University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Uh, Stuart Varner was our original co-PI, um, but with his departure to Penn, uh, Amanda Henley is now joining our team. So the uh, project began in October 2015, again, and we spent the last year developing the curriculum that seeks to train librarians and LIS professionals in approaches and tools frequently used in text mining research. 
And this year, we're now launching pilot workshops at all five partner institutions this fall and spring to test drive the curriculum. So to talk about the curriculum in a bit of detail, the anchor of the curriculum is the, HTR, is the tools and services in the HTRC. So we teach them to work with the HTRC portal, which enables researchers to, again, build data sets of text, work sets from the public domain corpus and the HathiTrust Digital Library, and then they can run a selection of data mining algorithms that are pre-installed with the portal, um, of course, with the caveats that were mentioned earlier today. Um, and then also we are teaching them how to extract um, other ways of um, getting Hadi Trust data through things such as the API and what we call extractive features. But we also realize that librarians operate in many different contexts and field a wide range of research questions. So our focus is to really teach about the fundamentals about text mining and perhaps what we might call data science skills. We introduce participants to the command line, how to harvest data through web scraping, how to clean tabular data, and how to run basic Python skip scripts for data manipulation and basic types of text analysis, such as words frequency. Um, our curriculum is targeted at beginners mostly, and the platforms we use in teaching, such as Python Anywhere, are aimed at making these skills and activities as widely accessible as possible in various teaching environments. And so we ultimately aim to build foundational skills in text mining in librarians through a train the trainer approach. After the attendees participate in our workshops, uh, we hope to put them on the road to developing these foundational skills, and they also will be given a full suite of instructional resources and tools at their disposal to then teach the workshops at their own institutions. So next year, um, after we do the pilots and refine the curriculum a bit more, we'll conduct a nationwide roadshow of workshops that will train LIS professionals at major conferences and in key geographic areas around the United States um, in teaching both the HTR schools and uh, the uh, principles of large scale text mining. Um, after the workshops conclude, we will refine our materials one last time and then release a toolkit that will contain a finalized package of the curriculum materials, tutorials, and other resources that all librarians can take and use, and it'll be hosted on our open institutional repository. And another outcome we hope to build is, is a, a network community of librarians who want to continue these conversations and share their experiences as they begin to teach text mining and digital scholarship at their own institutions. And also throughout the project, we'll be conducting a research study that assesses the process of curriculum development for digital scholarship methods and also examines strategies for LIS professional development. In this way, we hope to build a community of practice around a curriculum as the trainers become, trainees become trainers. So our project, I believe, will be a significant step forward in addressing the questions of how do we build skills in digital humanities and digital scholarship and for data-driven research in our libraries. And I propose that there are a couple of particular larger issues that we should consider and begin to think, rethink about librarianship uh, as we increase our interactions with digital scholarship work. So first, as been uh, made clear by previous pr presenters today, we need to reconceptualize our work in collection curation and engagement. So not all librarians are collection managers, but most of us touch and interact with collections in various ways from reference to cataloging to information architecture and interface design. And with the rapid rise in digital collections and our own holding as well as throughout the scholarly landscape, from the vast digital resources such as the Hadi Trust through to our small local digital collections, librarians will have to engage with collections as digital curators become familiar with data acquisition and think broader, think about the broader multiplicity of ways that users want to engage with our collections in digital and physical formats. And a lot, another key area and opportunity along with this is how librarians can engage in more points in the research life cycle. So scholars across the disciplines are gathering growing amounts of data, incorporating data in different stages of the research process, and are looking to the library as a source of research support beyond just providing research and reference guidance. And this is reflected in the changing neighbor, nature of who we're hiring in the library for areas such as data curation, GIS analysis, and data and scholarly publishing. The 2011 Value of Academic Libraries report from the Association of College and Research Libraries notes that, quote, research collaborations between faculty and librarians continue to benefit both partners. Faculty benefit from library resources and librarian expertise. Librarians benefit from the opportunity to secure the library's future as a significant partner in research and scholarship, end quote. The value report is only one of a number of studies that suggest that research partnerships between researchers and librarians is more necessary than ever. So in conclusion, I believe 
projects such as ours will catalyze broader thought processes on how to train and prepare librarians to meet the demands of data-driven research and scholarship. We might consider these questions. What infrastructures do libraries need to build or revise for supporting digital scholarship? How do we empower librarians to build the skills needed to respond to new research needs? And how can librarians share skills, materials, and resources for supporting digital scholarship? So as we think more about how do we translate our collections into usable and accessible data, I believe that the skills and research co connections forged by librarians with faculty and researchers will be key to advancing our success. So I want to thank, uh, again, the IMLS for supporting our project, as well as the Hadi Trust Research Center and our partnering institutions, um, Image Credits, and thank you. Device switcheroo. I have learned after a long, painful experience that I can't type my password and start talking at the same time. So um, my computer is very secure, but I definitely can't multitask for that password. Um, so I want to say that I'm absolutely thrilled um, to been, have been invited to speak today alongside um, so many folks doing such amazing work. Um, I hope that there is not a level of jaded cynicism at which you know, getting to speak at the Library of Congress is um, not really all that, um, because it is. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to be on this, on this panel for two reasons. One, because my co-panelists are both people from whom I have learned a lot and whom I continue to look to, to learn, um, but also because the, this topic of developing communities of practice um, is one that I have a lot of complicated feelings about and uh, um, that I um, love to talk about. So, um, and I'm gonna try to do this in the context of this uh, initiative that we're working on at the University of Maryland, um, Synergies Among Digital Humanities and African American History and Culture. And in a couple minutes, we're gonna put that sort of front and center, but I wanted to just sort of make one other personal note um, which is to say that I engage with collections, you know, so me personally, I engage with collections as data in a number of ways. I occasionally write code to do some analysis or satisfy a curiosity. I have been guilty of committing the occasional data visualization. Um, however, <laughs> my main job is to work with people um, who are doing things with collections or want to do things with collections, and these are both analog and digital collections. And, or maybe more precisely, my job is to help bring together and facilitate groups of humans who are engaged with data. And so I want to talk about the ways in which we're thinking through some of the issues that arise in the context of this initiative. Uh, so Synergies Among Digital Humanities and African American History and Culture is the formal name of our project, but it's far too long uh, to keep saying over and over again. Uh, so we also refer to it as the Ad Hume Initiative, and that's what I'll be doing henceforth. Um, you'll notice that uh, English grammar forces us to put those terms in one order uh, for euphony, um, but it is important that the African American part comes first, um, A-A-D-H-U-M, Ad Hume. Um, so this is our project hashtag, um, where hopefully we will um, be able to have uh, further conversation around this topic. Um, and I should also say that what you're hearing today is, of course, only one voice um, from what is already a sort of large and multifaceted initiative. Um, so this is me, that's my uh, Twitter handle, my contact information. Um, but of course, I'm also speaking to you as a member of a, a community, or really multiple other communities. Uh, the people who have been working hard for uh, two years to make this initiative a reality at Maryland. Um, the team of people beyond that um, who are now joining the project and contributing their skills. And yet, even though this project is only uh, really uh, seven or eight months old, already the number of people, uh, the community of people who are engaged in this work is quite large. Um, so I can only speak to, you know, the limits of my personal experience and my reflections on the work that we are collectively doing together. Um, and I think it's important not to forget um, that we are always enmeshed in these larger communities. And I'll come back to that point in a second. Um, so the website for today's event explained in, in the kind of intro text 
that the rise of accessible digital collections, I'm quoting here, coupled with development of tools for processing and analyzing data has enabled researchers to create new models of scholarship and inquiry. Um, I'm a humanist, so I can't help sort of picking at the terms of the debate. Um, and so I think one way that we can then understand communities of practice is as one model of these new, new modes of scholarship and inquiry, which is to say communities are part of how accessible digital collections may be coupled with or may fail to be coupled with tools for processing and analyzing data to do work that matters to other humans. And so my basic premise then is that a world of collections as data depends upon the design and nurturing of communities. Um, and the phrase communities of practice, I think is an, is, it's important to realize that this is a subset, right? The phrase communities of practice is a term of art and it comes from a particular place. Uh, to sketch this history very briefly and to do it um, absolutely no justice at all, um, the original nexus for the concept of communities of practice is in workplace anthropology and it was chiefly focused on understanding adult learning and improving adult learning. And it was further developed to describe sort of ad hoc and improvised ways of sharing knowledge uh, within organizations, within workplaces to quote, get the job done um, when existing knowledge or managerial direction falls short. And of course, people who've engaged with this idea have also been interested in how, um, how these practices create and reshape the identities of workers. And thus, perhaps unsurprisingly, the concept of communities of practice um, has been taken up and discussed as a managerial tool, especially for breaking through institutional barriers and promoting, quote, innovation. Um, Andrew Cox has provided a very useful overview of the seminal works on community of practice in a 2005 article in the Journal of Information Science, for those of you who are interested in more. Um, and, and the progression that he traces is certainly toward a more and more sort of organo organizational studies, managerial approach um, to communities of practice. Um, and so then what should we take from the, the career of this term of art, communities of practice? as a concept to take back with us for our reflections on how we think about collections as data. Certainly there is much to like. Learning as an active social process, not a mechanical transfer of skills and knowledge, the emphasis on Im improvising new forms of work when old ones no longer suit, the seductive allure of breaking through institutional barriers and building a group identity with other like-minded folks. Certainly I think the energy around today's um, event is certainly an expression of the hunger that we often feel when we use a term like communities of practice, right? We want to find others like us who are doing things the way that we're doing. Um, and that can be both beneficial and I think it can also um, block us from seeing other things. So what might the too easy acceptance of communities of practice as our vehicle um, for thinking about communities in the context of collections not allow us to see? Um, I think there's a tendency to treat communities of practice as though they might be an emergent property of materials and methods, um, right? If you make materials available um, and you have people who might be expert in certain methods or who are becoming expert in certain methods, they will find each other, uh, they will do amazing things, um, and certainly that is true. And some of the central scholarship on communities of practice can certainly be read to support this sort of quasi-emergent idea. Um, but in my experience, this is really almost never the case. Um, we're not seeing something important that's actually happening. It's important to remind ourselves that communities are not spontaneous or organic. Um, and to quote the wonderful critical theorist Miranda Joseph, who's written beautifully on the idea of community, uh, to invoke community is immediately to raise questions of belonging and of power. Um, and that, I think, is one area in which the work we're doing within the AdHume initiative is sort of asking us to push beyond um, the idea of communities of practice that we've inherited from a kind of organizational studies context. In that context, um, it sort of notoriously has done very little to grapple with sort of notions of power and dominance, which are, of course, an important element of the, of the communities that we all live in. I think it's important to understand that communities of practice are always communities within other communities. Uh, the work of designing them, because it is intentional design, and nurturing them, 
also intentionally, um, will always be done in the context of the communities in which we already live. The structures of power, the relationships between people of different backgrounds, different experiences that exist in those communities already. Uh, we don't get to just sort of wipe the slate clean and talk in very sort of narrow techn technocratic terms about communities of practice as though they weren't already imbricated in the American community, the DC community, whatever community we find ourselves living in, the campus community. Um, that we, and we have to sort of take this into account in terms of both design and nurturing. Um, it may be that not everyone who's working in our community um, you know, comes to work um, you know, with the same uh, sort of emotional experience of things happening out there in the larger world. Um, and so this is why I think it's imperative not to let the active work of community development sort of fall below the level of our full attention. Um, because this work demands as, every bit as much as the building of collections or the development of tools. And we are responsible for the communities we create or fail to create. I think um, listening to the talk earlier, you know, um, we're working toward being maybe a little bit more like some of those fan fiction communities that we were hearing about. Um, and that might look different from the way that we understand um, communities of sort of senior scholars and junior scholars or academics and members of the public. So to try and explain a little bit more of what I mean in concrete terms, I'll say a little bit more about how we're working through these challenges in the Adhum Initiative. Um, the initiative is funded by a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and we're about three quarters of the way into the first year of three years of work. With the leadership of the Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities, Bonnie Thornton Dill, the work of Adhum is led by the Center for Synergy under the direction of Sherry Parks, and the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities or Myth under the direction of my boss, Neil Freistadt. Um, also partnering in the initiative are the Center for Global Migration Studies, the David C. Driscoll Center for the Study of Visual Arts and Culture of African Americans and the African Diaspora, as well as the University Libraries, where I report to my other boss. Um, and the work of Adhum is led by our faculty director, Catherine Knight Steele, and includes postdoctoral associates, myths, digital humanities, research faculty and staff, an advisory board of scholars from multiple disciplines invested in the study of African American culture and history, librarians and archivists, graduate assistants, and we hope faculty, students, library and cultural heritage professionals, and members of a still wider community that we hope to fold in. And it's worth saying, since Harriet mentioned the earlier iterations of the Digital Humanities Incubator, which is part of our plans for the Adhum Initiative, that we've gone from the first iteration where it was solely focused on building up um, skills and capacity in among our librarians to a model where everyone is all mixed together. And we take on that greater challenge of having all these people mixed together with their different experiences, different expertise, um, because ultimately I think that's the way we need to be working. Um, and so the goals of the Adhum Initiative are to advance and expand the fields of digital humanities and African American history and cultural studies and to develop and diversify the pipeline for the next generation of scholars and professionals who foster engagement at this intersection. Which is to say that we are directly engaged in building communities of practice, in building communities, and that these communities will be a measure of our project as much as any of the scholarship, whether it be digital projects or traditional publications, or new courses or public programming that we also produce, right? We are willing to be measured by the community that we are creating um, because that is a critical part of the work that the grant has set itself out to do. So rather than produce a single research project, Adhum seeks to transform both the digital humanities and the African American cultural studies fields. And so to accomplish this goal, we'll, you know, we will do a number of things. We will foster a cohort of scholars and students working at this intersection. This cohort will facilitate all the kinds of people that I just mentioned. Uh, we'll be creating and revising new courses at the University of Maryland um, in disciplines related to African American history and culture, um, which is frankly all of them. Um, and to provide training and development opportunities to support local and regional participants in conceiving and producing new research. I'm coming to that part in a second. Um, we're also planning to organize a national conference to bring together um, those parts of this network that we can, uh, who are doing digital research like this, that we can touch, that we can reach. Um, 
and to oversee digitization and description of archival collections at the Driscoll Center and the George Meany Memorial AFL-CIO Archive at the University of Maryland Libraries that are relevant to research on African-American labor, migration, and artistic expression, which are the core themes around which we're organizing our work. Um, and I, I want to stop here and say also that this is only sort of the latest entry in work that many people have been doing for a very long time, right? Again, we're not wiping the slate clean. It's not, we are not newly bringing into being this uh, collaborative community between people working in uh, digital ways and people studying African American history and life. There's a long history of such work and we are just happy to be joining that conversation, trying to do our part. Um, so lest the central point be lost in all of these details, um, the way I would describe our community of practice, our community, is to say that Adhume is a community invested in the study of African American history and culture. And I, I want to phrase it that way because I think often, because of the history of the term communities of practice, we find ourselves using it in far too technocratic a sense, right? That it's about skills transfer or achieving some sort of organizational mission. Um, and so we're putting um, the idea of uh, all the different ways that we could use digital methods, digital tools, digital collections to study African American history and culture at the center. And by no means does that mean we are giving up being invested in a vision of digital work um, that explores new ways of using computing um, and that is informed by you know, the scholars who have studied African American history and culture before our project even began. And a lot of the work um, right now is it sort of imagining the, the programming that we call the digital humanities incubators, that we have called the digital humanities incubators in the past. And my colleagues, Catherine Knight Steele and Purdom Lindblad, are really leading this work, and I'm really sort of reflecting and reporting on, on the great work that they're doing. Um, and as I kind of hinted, the DH incubators have been an evolving process um, where we started very much in the idea focused on being a way of sort of incubating project ideas, right? Building particular skills and capacities such that librarians could do digital projects. Um, and that had some, some positives as far as they went. Um, but then the next time we got a chance to run this programming, we decided that we would put the data at the center. And that has been a new idea um, that has sort of stuck with us, right? That we put the data in the center um, and ask our community all the ways in which they might wish to respond to it without presuming that we know particular methods or techniques that we just simply need to communicate outward to them. Um, the, um, the scholar of visual culture, Laura Wexler, um, makes a nice point um, with regard to crowdsourcing um, and talking about how we go beyond sort of using the crowd for data collection or data production and being open to all the other ways in which the community might wish to respond to a given data set or a given collection and to also be open to taking that in, even though it be goes beyond, say, perhaps simple transcription. And so the idea of the incubators is still evolving. And we're evolving this idea with the, with the uh, ethics of building a community fully in mind, right? So this perhaps means how do we stay in touch with people who come into contact with us or engaging with us for longer than we might um, if it was simply skills training, right? How do we build an ongoing relationship? Uh, another aspect of it is where do we do this work, right? We're all sort of embodied people and the spaces in which we do this work and who else is in the room um, matters a lot about who can access and who can feel like they're part of our community. Um, so that's an aspect that we're really um, thinking about. Um, and uh, Erling Bjorgvinson, Pelle Ann, and Per Anders Hilgren, pardon my pronunciation, um, who are sort of some key practitioners from the tradition of participatory design um, have a nice way of thinking about this. And they are citing actually the work of Lucy Suchman, the feminist uh, historian of technology. Um, and she's arguing that we need to get away from viewing things as discrete objects and networks of devices, but instead to start viewing design work and technological development as, quote, entry into networks of working relations, including both contests and alliances that make technical systems possible. And as Bjorgvinson, N. and Helgren write, this is hard design work where various contexts or practices 
um, and technologies concurrently undergo change and therefore demand continuous, what they call continuous infrastructuring and aligning of partly conflicting interests. So I think it's useful to think about the work we do about building community around collections, around data, as this work of continuous infrastructuring. To think about it in terms of the people who are in our communities, um, the emotions that they're having, the desires that they have, the goals that they have, um, and then to structure the work that we do around um, how do we imagine sort of aligning all those partly conflicting interests, not getting caught up in the rush of finding people who are just doing things like us, but to think hard and do that hard design work, um, to do the hard design work of continuous infrastructuring or of designing and nurturing communities. So just as a closing thought, it seems to me that communities of practice may be a fine starting point for how we imagine access and use models for digital collections, but it certainly can't be the stopping point. Uh, most of the core scholarship on communities of practice is 20 and 30 years old, which of course doesn't make it outdated in the humanities, but I'm sure people have said lots of interesting things since then. Um, and in the spirit of being good interdisciplinary borrowers, we should probably try to engage those ideas as well. Um, and I think it's particularly important as we do this um, to think about how we make collections of, as data into what Miranda Joseph calls legitimate sites of empathy and concern. Thank you. I'm another computer person, so give me a moment. I've always had this dream that I would chat and say witty things as I got set up, but mm, no. I won't go so far as to say the dream is dead, but it's not thriving. But fortunately, I have my bag my mommy bag of dongles. <laughs> so I've been interested today in sort of thinking about how things can be pulled together, right? I'm not here necessarily to pull things together, but I'm always interested, this is one of the problems of coming at the end of the day, I'm always sort of interested in where we can find connections between the things that have always been said. This is my like, way of copping out on the fact that like, I'm going so much at the end of the day and there's so much to say because of course, I've been sort of hyper-stimulated by all this stuff that people have said before. So I want to begin today by thinking about the kinds of issues that emerge when we think about data as a personal matter. So often we speak of collections writ large, and we're thinking about small things, right? So there's a way in which we talk about collections when we're thinking about sort of, you know, digital humanities and library work and archives and so on. But when you're thinking about the raw material that constitutes collections, you're often just talking about personal things, right? At some point, much of what we refer to as something pulled into a collection was something personal. And that's a little bit what I want to talk about today. Right, collections or letters and attics, the boxes of receipts, piles of playbills in someone's closet. I had the huge privilege of being able to go to the museum of um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture opening this weekend, and a, a lot was made, I think, rightfully, of how so much of this sort of material history has been left out of conversation because it's been squirreled away in the attics of people who are not included in those kinds of archival conversations previously. So it was really sort of weighing on me as I prepared this talk and thinking about collections. I also want to think about what is gained and lost in the transition from one kind of nervous space, the local and the personal, into other kinds of uses, the archival, the computational, or so on. Um, and even though I prefer not to belabor the usual dichotomies, even though I kind of began with one in my title, um, I've pulled this term datum storytelling because it helps me think about issues that emerge at the intersection of data, the way we talk about now, data, big data, so on, the revealed, the excavated, the collected, the seen, and the personal, 
which can be all those things, but also brings with it a sense of what is at stake in ownership, management, or the control thereof. If we accept that there is any conceptual value in data, then we must also accept that our lives have always been lived in streams of data. Data is a trace. I'm thinking here of recent works. Um, for instance, the work done by Lupi and Posovic, um, this project you may have seen called Dear Data, in which the, each person, they're both artists, collected all kinds of personal information, then converted the personal information tracked over a week into hand-drawn data visualizations. I found this super interesting, right? I'll put it back so you can see a little bit more. I found this super interesting because there was a way in which it kind of took this notion of tracking, right? The watch you wear, the wearables, and so on, and made it back into what we usually think of as an easier kind of analog art, right? So I was interested then in sort of how they talk about it as well. This is a quote. We've always conceived Dear Data, they write, as a personal documentary rather than a quantified self-project, which is a subtle but important distinction. Instead of using data just to become more efficient, we argue we use data to become more humane and to connect with ourselves and others at a deeper level. For Lupi and Posovic, life is parsed into data and so transformed produces newly malleable raw material for art, story, and visualization. In Dear Data, each datum is self-consciously deployed to tell a story. Datum storytelling, then, is a way of thinking about intentionality in archival development collection and without losing, at the same time, sight of people, the sight of the human. Um, and later on, I want to interrogate this notion of the human just a little bit, but for now, we'll go with this, right? But when we're thinking about this in data, the human, the person, is a reference and I'm thinking of a human who can self-consciously manage, disseminate, parlay, and remix their trace. This reminds me of some of the restorative work that we know happens as we age. Telling stories and returning to our personal collections grounds our sense of self very much in that which is familiar. And so the metaphor I always use for this is this notion of sort of digging in the crates, right? A sort of hip hop term. The idea is that there's a sort of archive that you're constantly digging through, but you're digging through it with the interest, I'll put it back, um, you're digging through it in the interest of being able to show people something new. So the archival is specifically deployed, again, the new is made out of the old, which sounds very corny when you say it like that, but when you're there, right, it's a moment of intense, sort of meaningfulness, right? And it's very corny, I was looking for it. There's this old sort of, you know, God, it was really embarrassing because I was looking for it and I realized it was essentially like a Coke commercial or something, they had won in some moment of marketing and it was this old sort of, you know, Mary J. Blige and Method Man commercial. And in that commercial, they were playing the song, You're All I Need to Get By. And it was like a kid upstairs listening to the hip hop version. And then the grandparents downstairs listening to the old sort of Marvin Gaye, Tanny Terrell version. And the idea was like they showed a split space, the floor. And upstairs, right, you have the kids thumping out. And downstairs, the grown ups are like, Yes, they finally found the truth, right? So this notion of sort of digging in the crates, I've always found really interesting. Um, and I think it's useful for thinking about the individual making choices, the generational and community. It also brings to the forefront the idea of curation, the idea that the past itself is a collection, and that we think today about processing that collection to give historical contour to an otherwise infinitely mutable present. The idea of digging in the crates brings with it the joy of discovery, a joy amplified by artistic transformations that archival discovery will enable. What is more difficult to conceptualize, however, are the limits, or if there should be a limit to that digging. In an essay titled, The Digital Afterlife of Lost Family Photos, Teju Cole describes work done by the artist Zun Lee, you can see it here on the screen, called Fade Resistance. In this project, Lee takes us as a medium found photographs of African Americans. So the kind of stuff we were talking about, or I was talking about in terms of the museum, the stuff in attics, the stuff at flea markets, right? These collections of photographs that have been orphaned now, so no one knows to whom they belonged. But we know, of course, by virtue of being photographs collected, they were important to someone, right? How do we fill that gap? How do we think about this? Cole recounts one of Lee's anecdotes from the project, and I'm going to share it here because it encapsulates in a different way how we might experience a transition from data to datum in our increasingly digital life worlds. Who took these photos? 
Who do they depict, Cole asks. The basic contextual details we would usually expect from snapshots are missing here. The absence of this information is bittersweet. We are bewildered, but we are also ferried over from imagery into imagination. In Lee's case, the story of his orphaned Polaroids took a surprising turn. When he uploaded some of them to Facebook, the social network's facial recognition technology immediately began to match them with real people. Lee was not sure who was doing the tagging. Intrigued and wary, he sent a message to one individual who was tagged in several of the pictures. There was no response. Then several weeks later, he got a message from the same man, a curt request that he take the pictures down. Of the experience, Lee notes that, quote, he'd already been thinking about how databases and tags are not neutral, how they can wind up being hostile towards communities of color. I completely understand, Lee told Cole. Quote, this man was saying, we are not willing participants. The black body is used as a commodity, as something that is surveilled. The man was telling me, no, you're not welcome. This is not art. Get the hell out of our lives. And I understood it. Insofar as collection bespeaks curation, then our work, we must also be ready to think about the rightful sense of danger that the very idea of being collected might bring. And by extension, the technically invasive work of conversion of objects and moments into data, the parsing and the combine. So it's important, by the way, I should note in this talk that I'm actually quite a technical person, so it's kind of a shadow technical talk behind this. When I'm talking about sort of parsing collections and data, I'm thinking about some of the stuff we got earlier today of thinking about using images as text, for instance. I'm thinking about JSON. I'm thinking about the ways in which we break these larger things down into smaller, compartmentalized, and remixable units, right? The parsing. So be clear, so it's got shadow behind it. It's like the tech shadow. Right, but I only have so much time, so I'm just rushing through the other part for now. Oh, I wish I could have a superhero name, like Tech Shadow, but whatever. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> so I'm also taken with the problem of disappearance, which by default works against this work. In his essay, one example Coles turns to um, actually is this one, this photo. As he reads the back of the photo, um, he says, quote, it suggests that it was pasted into an album and then ripped out. And people who do this kind of work can be, are familiar with this, even sort of the blackness of the glue which shows it was archival, it was a particular kind of glue that was used, so when it was pasted into the album, it was made to last, but then it was nonetheless ripped out, right? How do we map and mark that transition? How do we think about it? As well, this is no mere glue stick decision. As equally significant to us then in this image is what is hidden from us. Much, is what, much of what is at stake in this example comes down to ownership, for the idea of personal collection is also an exercise in exclusion. Right, and my example is this, I've been doing work for the last year using Octavia Butler um, Manuscript Archive, which is just amazing. But whenever I'm working, I'm at some point sort of overwhelmed by the sense that I have to be careful in thinking about that archive as her collection. It's a collection of her stuff, but insofar as she died suddenly and unexpectedly and young, we must as researchers live with the fact that she had little hand in its curation. I always wonder what she would have thrown away, and there's everything there, like little slips of paper, receipts, all kinds of private information, right? On the one hand, the fullness of that archive is a boon for researchers like me, but because she so carefully otherwise crafted her public life, I know that her deletions would have probably been just as instructive albeit ghostly, as a somewhat wholesale inclusivity. I'm intrigued in thinking about what it means for her to lose so much of that narration, to lose agency despite legacy. Digging the crates and permission just really can't always coexist when we're thinking of the past. Many, of course, have taken up the ethical questions of opening archives and so on, but I just want to think about this for a moment as a way of introducing this notion of how we might mourn in the midst of opportunity. So I'll move on. At the forefront, forefront of thinking about purpose and the MO of digital work, for me, it's been a commitment to openness, and we hear this a lot, it's important work, which as many have pointed out, unlocks some of the negative or oppressive ownership relations historically associated with resource-enabled entities, collecting from sometimes even willing, but usually not others, when a big institution comes and gets all your stuff, right? Regardless, if openness, publicness, and access are the hallmarks of decolonial approaches to archive making, and I believe they are, 
I am also nonetheless interested in the meaningfulness of exclusion, elision, and deletion, but sometimes even in the name of narrative making. The meaningfulness, in other words, of storytelling. I am thinking here of Michelle Caswell's work on thinking about the kinds of agency made possible through the collection and also the deployment of archival materials. In inventing new archival imaginaries, theoretical foundations for identity-based community archives, Caswell reminds us that, quote, memory archives are not just memory activists, but visionaries whose work reconceives imagined worlds through space and time. In aligning archival work with memory and its futures, rather than only with historical recovery or representation of the past, Caswell offers us a way to think very instrumentally about our own archival projects. If, following Caswell, archives are, quote, not just about documenting a more diverse version of the past based on the identities of present, but rather by uncovering previously untold, ignored, or misinterpreted histories, Communities can imagine and reimagine different trajectories for the future. So it's not just enough to say we're going to expand our archive by putting more kinds of people into it, right? This notion of empowerment around the archive is also about making the archive available in such a way that it can also be disseminated by the communities that need it most, right? It's an important distinction. Thinking about this, I would argue, gets us towards the generative possibilities of eliciting data, even computationally, from datum. In a talk titled Networked Knowledge in Digital Spaces, Storytelling as Decolonial Methodology, Emily Legg, building on the work of scholars of indigenous memory and history, asks us to think in very material ways about, quote, storytelling as knowledge making and a way of knowing that is not placed within one individual who passes down to others. Instead, it is knowledge that exists in a network state within the role of the community as knowledge partners. Again, I offer not all of this to make a commentary um, on the difference between storytelling and like the local versus data and like the machines or something, but that if we're thinking about how to decol decolonize that which is collected, we must also be thinking about knowledge transfer and therefore thinking differently about design and interface. The motion quote of knowledge is seated in its carotid context and emerges when we're supposed to listen to it. The idea, right, is that you can't necessarily approach an archive already knowing what you're expecting to get. A proper archive, and this is something that's come up all day today for serendipity, right? The idea, right, is that the archive is a depository that also teaches you, and that teaching depends on you on some level not knowing what you're going to get when you go there. But as you can imagine, this is a very compelling design problem. How do we enable these arrivals, arrivals right? And underlying some of this, right, I'm thinking about, you know, someone like Ashil Mbembe, right, who in Decolonizing Knowledge points out, quote, decolonization is not about only design, tinkering with the margins. It is about reshaping, turning human beings once again to craftsmen and craftswomen, who in reshaping matters and forms need not to look at pre-existing models and need not to use them as paradigms. One of the deepest problematics we know of so many archives or archival collections, digital collections, is that they're modeled, right, on different kinds of repositories that assume you're working materially with the papers at hand. The digital is, in fact, different. I know many people are talking about this, but when we're thinking again about what interface can do, we need to be parlaying the digital rather than imagining we're reproducing some lost art form, some lost world, some idea of physical space that in its own ways was also oppressive. So at Five College Digital Humanities, we try to really work on ways of integrating these sort of theoretical and conceptual understandings alongside sort of very material practice. Again, it's like, again, the sort of shadow background. I'm talking about real projects. I'm talking about JSON. I'm talking about D3. I'm talking about all these things, right? I'm just trying to give you a different visuality for thinking it through, a different kind of visualization. One example of this work is our Zine Scenes project that go by at Beyond the Riot. Um, that's been a really interesting project, and I'll just say a little bit more about it quickly. Um, it works with what are essentially very localized zine collections, so small magazines made in very small communities, even just between friends. And as you can imagine, this is, holds a wealth of information about women's lives, right, in the last 30 to 50 years. It holds enormous information right, about all the ways girls, for instance, interact with pop culture and ideas about growing up and so on. It's a corpus that's impressive. But at the same time, you're explicitly dealing with materials that were made on some level to walk a very fine line between the private and the public, right? They're made to be shared, but they're private, 
That's a difficult line to think about. And think Twitter and social media gets in a similar place. It's public, but also kind of private. You wouldn't actually just jump into someone else's Twitter conversation if you don't know the people. It's sort of thinking about what that means, right? So they changed the project, not changed the project, but sort of grew the project then into thinking about not just a repository, but a quote, interactive digital subcultural platform. Right? The PIs, Alana Cumbier and Michelle Hardesty from Hampshire College, and Leslie Fields from Mount Holyoke College, along with their five college DH undergraduate fellow, Nora Miller, realized that not only does a collection enable a vast number of computational mapping and visualization possibilities, but that clicking, but that, sorry, eliciting the narrative and experiential meaningfulness of these incredibly localized and specific texts also meant creating some form of encounter interface that can enable the user to understand how the experience of finding a zine is as important as what the zine itself holds, that the experience of navigating the archive is as much an educational experience as finding the actual object which, which the archive holds. Much of the zine's value then reproduces what we've been reading about and thinking about in terms of sort of indigeneity in archives and reproducing a chirotic moment of discovery, right? A moment when you realize this is it. I did not know this was it. How did I live without this? What is this? Much like musical improvisation, this sense of discovery requires the production of an incredibly deeply tagged archive. So this thing I'm calling chirotic and spontaneous, in fact, requires an eminently deeply tagged metadata machine readable structure. Because if we imagine that interfaces can function in the kind of flexible ways that we would like them to, uh, the ways I would like them to, I'm getting away from the royal we, it's a sad day, but if we, the ways we want them to work, right, then there's a way in which we have to go in the opposite direction of what one imagines this conversation might go. Right? We turn back to the machine readable, we turn back to the compartmentalized, we turn back to the smallest bits of data because it requires, sorry, it produces the flexibility that makes possible more kinds of interfaces, more kinds of exchanges. It's a quandary. We have to break it even more than we realized. This means moving away from retrieval as the archive's purpose and instead focusing on enabling users to personalize their encounters, to bring what they made to the archive, and by virtue of their own specificity, use it to make their own things. I'm happy to say more about this, particularly as the Zine Scenes Project must also grapple with the kinds of resistance that Teju Cole wants us to think about, when to exclude and when to delete. Many items in the collection were likely produced by people who never intended for them to be disseminated at the kind of scale digitization makes possible. They might want to share it, but the digital is something else, and it's something none of us could have imagined 30 years ago. Again, if we imagine the most critically informed, decolonial, future-oriented perspective on archives, that work must still, nonetheless, grapple with the question of refusal that must be the part of any democratic understanding of data. At any moment, datum, the individual, must be recovered by being extracted from data, never to be returned again. I'll stop there. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.